Why do bad things happen to good people? If you've been around for any period of time in your life, you've probably had somebody ask you, or you've, you've asked yourself, I just don't get it. They're such a good person, or I'm such a good person. <laughs> and you're like, I don't get it. Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, this is a very common question that people ask, and I want to I wanna tackle it. But before I jump into that, I want to talk about Coke versus Pepsi. If you've been around for any period of time, you've seen the battles between Coke and Pepsi trying to, to fight for your business. They want you to buy their product. For the longest time, Coke was always more successful. No matter what Pepsi did, Coke was going to be more successful. They were going to win that battle of selling more product than Pepsi did. And Pepsi couldn't figure out what they were doing wrong. Like, how can we edge out and sell more product than Coke? Coke had that great hourglass bottle. Pepsi came up with a, a twisted glass bottle thinking that might fix it. They tried different slogans, different marketing campaigns. Nothing would work. And then all of a sudden, things changed. After decades of failure, John Scully turned things around. He basically was talking to the team at Pepsi. He says, you know what the problem here is? We're asking the wrong question. We're trying to sell more bottles. That's our goal. We've been trying to sell more bottles for such a long time, but we're not a bottle making company. We're a soda company. Our goal should be to try and sell more soda. And so after some brainstorming and thinking through things, Pepsi came up with the two liter bottle. And for the first time in their history, they ended up edging out Coke and selling more product. It's because they were selling more soda. That's what they were trying to do. They're a soda company, not a bottle company. The key thing there is they were asking the wrong question. Let's look at this question through a biblical lens. Why do bad things happen to good people? The first thing I would ask you, what determines good? Who gets to determine good? Think about it. Is the parent that is disciplining, disciplining the child, they get to determine if that child's being good or bad. Is it the boss that's determining whether a, a, an employee is a good employee or a bad employee? I think for the most part, if we're honest with ourselves, we tend to think of ourselves as good. You know, I, I, I do some wrong or I've made mistakes, but overall I'm a good person. But let's look at Luke chapter 18. You see, in Luke chapter 18, we, we've got a parable of the rich young ruler. And it says, Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that's God. Now just so you know, Jesus was not saying he's not God there. He was emphasizing that there is only one good, and that is God. Of course, he was fully God and fully man, so he also is good. But it's interesting that he's causing this rich young ruler to ponder as well as the disciples. Let's go on. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. He said, all these things I have kept from my youth. The rich young ruler looks at the rules, the laws, the things that, that the Lord has set up and said, you know what? I feel pretty validated. I'm a good person. I follow these rules. I'm, I don't do any of these hideous things like murder and, and adultery and the things that I, I'm a good person. And Jesus says, no, I think you might be missing it. This is a heart issue. He goes on to say, uh, so Jesus heard these things and said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he had become very sorrowful, he said, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, So we have left all and followed you. 
And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. We have to abandon all. So the rich young ruler was not good simply because he followed the rules. Goodness only comes from God. And that threshold of being considered good can only be through Christ. It's nothing that we can do. It's nothing that we can say. Our goodness is only what we see of the Lord living in us and through us. We're not good all by ourselves. And we don't get to determine goodness based on a set of rules or a set of a list of things that say, oh, well, you gave at this time, or you served at this time, or you've been in church for this long. That's not how goodness is determined. So when we say, why do bad things happen to good people? We have to conclude that the person is good. It's the wrong question. It's a false pretense. It's not really biblically sound. When, when someone thinks they're good, perhaps that's the, the first problem. If you look at Romans, it says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How many sins does it take to make a sinner? How many murders does it take to make a murderer? <laughs> See, we're all broken. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Ecclesiastes 7, 20, it says, Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one, no one who has done what is right and never sins. Romans chapter 3, 9 and 12, 9 through 12, it says, For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one, there's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. My friend, no matter how great you think you might be or how great you think someone else is, there's no one good but God. That's just the reality of it. And. The further reality is that he's already explained for us what our lack of goodness, what our sin brings us. The wages of sin is death. We've earned it. Death does not feel very good. Death does not seem like a, a lighthearted, you know, smile, feel good moment. Death is dark. Death is sad. Death is difficult. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So, no matter what you think, the question is not, why do bad things happen to good people? The first question is, why do we think that we're good? The second question that I think is really important that we ask is, who gets to determine bad? The, the notion of why do bad things happen to good people, I would ask you, um, if someone, if, if the teenager that gets grounded, is the grounding a bad thing or a good thing? Well, if you ask the teenager, they're gonna feel something very different than if you ask the adult. Does a fender bender caused by a young person qualify as a bad thing? I mean, they're learning a lesson, or perhaps they got caught doing something they shouldn't have done as a result of that fender bender, or any number of other things that I could come up with that would say, maybe it's not such a bad thing. If you ask the child, or if you ask the adult, they would initially probably think it's a bad thing. What about if you have an accident yourself, and that accident ends up with broken ribs, broken, broken limbs, you go to the hospital, you don't have insurance, you can't afford it. Is that a bad thing? Well, what if 
in that same accident, that's what caused you to get an MRI. And that MRI discovered a cancerous tumor that you would have never found. But because you found it when you did, you're able to have it treated and you can have a, a, a longer life as a result. You're, it's not taken from you. So it's very, very easy we're in the, when we're in the moment of something or when we're looking at everything through the lens of my life, my goodness, it's very easy to interpret things that are happening to us or around us as bad. And I, I think that there's some error in doing this, especially if we're walking with the perspective of what the Bible shares with us. I love Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, 28, it says, And we know that in all things God works together for the good of those who love Him and who have been called according to His purposes. Bad is a matter of perspective. It's a matter of perspective. Because no matter what happens to me, no matter what happens around me, I can walk with the confidence that all things work together for my good because I love the Lord. I'm called according to His purposes. I'm trying to live my life in a way that pleases Him, that honors Him, that serves Him. So when something bad happens, A, I'm not going to think of my goodness because I know I'm fallen, I'm flawed, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I know that there's this constant process of sanctification where I need to continually go back to the Lord and say, God, help me, purify me, forgive me, because I'm human. I'm a flawed individual. So I know it's not my goodness, but I also know when something bad happens, I can look at it and say, praise the Lord, because all things work together for my good. So it may feel bad. It may seem bad. It may impact me physically. It may impact me financially. But I know that all things, including whatever it is I'm going through, work together for my good because I love the Lord and I'm called according to His purposes. But you see, this, this is often not what happens. We get reactive when we get in the middle of something or we feel a certain way when we see somebody that we love or that we care about go through something, we immediately start to feel, you know, sorry for them. But I, don't, I just don't get it. They're good. They're such a good person. They live their life a good way. They, they seem to love the Lord. Not, not necessarily the way the Lord sees it. Romans chapter 5, verses 3, 3 through 5, it says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. <laughs> My friends, Sometimes what seems bad, maybe it's just because the Lord's trying to develop us. And He loves us enough, He cares for us enough that He wants to allow us to be shaped, to be formed, to be molded, to develop a perseverance, to develop character that we wouldn't get otherwise. But because of this seemingly bad thing, we get that. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. <laughs> That's how I want to go through my life. I'm, I'm seeking the Lord to continually improve me, to make me better, to make me more like Him, to draw me closer to Him. And as I draw closer to Him, the impurities in my life have to get taken out. And those impurities, that purification process comes through fire. It comes through difficulty. It comes through suffering sometimes. This is biblical. So we have to have a biblical perspective. Oftentimes I, I, I meet different people especially on staff at my church. I, I see, I meet people in my church that, that are going through different things that I don't, I don't often understand because I too fall into the, the ill, uh, the, the improper view of, oh, I don't understand, they're such good people, but they've had so much loss. I remember one time I was talking with 
a member of our church. He and his wife, they had had three losses within a week and a half's time. Within a week and a half. And these weren't just elderly you know, people that passed away that were expected because of you know, getting up in age. No, one of them was their grandchild, one of them was a daughter, one of them was a, a sibling. Three losses in one week. And I remember, I remember going and saying, hey, uh, Harold, I don't, I, I'm, I don't know what to say, but I'm really sorry. And his response was just, uh, it was from a mature believer. He said, oh, it's okay. God is good all the time. He, he knew. He had come to peace with, a long time before this. He had come to peace with knowing that God is sovereign. He sits on the throne. And he knew who he was and that he was walking right with the Lord. And when these bad things happened, he was able to, he was able to look at this through a godly perspective that said, it's okay. Because I know God is good, I can walk in peace when seemingly bad happens. That's a godly perspective. See, we need to respond with perspective rather than react with presumption. We need to, we need to respond with perspective rather than react with presumption. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, it says, Therefore, do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. When something seemingly bad happens, we don't want to react. We take a moment, we take a step back, and our default response should always be, praise the Lord. I'm so grateful. I was walking down the road and the, the puddle splashed up you know, when the car drove by, praise the Lord. I stubbed my toe. Thank you, God. We should have a, a, an ongoing default position of giving thanks to God, glory to God in each and every situation, because that's our disposition to know that God is good all the time. And I can give thanks because I'm walking upright with the Lord. I love the Lord. I'm called according to his purposes. So I can not react presuming of my goodness or presuming that it's bad, and rather I can respond with a maturity, a perspective that says, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. So, we've talked about some, some I, I don't feel real difficult things, but some difficult concepts for us to maybe adopt in our own life. And I hope that this is helpful for you. I hope that as you work through situations in your life, or as you try to think through difficulties that you see with others, that you'll maybe have a, a, a heart towards recognizing maybe you aren't so good, contrary to what you might feel, but you can be when it's the Lord living in you and through you. When you're dead to self and the goodness of God is what's coming out of you, then we can give thanks and say, God, your goodness abounds and it's being expanded around those uh, the people around us, because we're walking upright with you and we're able to live with a proper perspective that the Bible has shared with us. I want to say that I do recognize that sometimes we go through some incredibly difficult things and there's not always a very clear understanding or explanation on why we go through those difficult things. What I can say is that over the years, um, especially being you know, on staff at my church, different people have gone through different things. And I've seen how others around them have reacted when they go through those, those hard times. You know, I'm speaking lightly with you and saying you're not so good and it's not so bad. Um, but to someone who is in the middle of that storm, I probably wouldn't be so, so 
uh, lighthearted in my approach with them. And I, I want to challenge you that if you're going through something or if you're around someone who's going through something, to operate and function with a godly sensitivity, a compassion, because they might be in the middle of their darkest time and it's really easy and you might feel real good to throw some scriptures out at them. That may not be the thing that, that helps them the most at the moment. Maybe they just need a hug. Maybe they just need you to uh, encourage them. Maybe they need you to, to go get them some food. You know, it could be something very tangible like that. Because when we're in the middle of that difficult time, we can't just expect that perspective is just going to change because someone says, you know, don't look at it that way. Look at it this way. It doesn't, it doesn't happen quite like that. So I just want to challenge you. Don't try to play God. Um, there is a God. You're not, you're not Him. I want to look at a few different things that, that kind of help to answer the question. Why do we go through hard times? We talked about why do bad people, why do bad things happen to good people? We've talked about the good part, the bad part. Now I want to talk about the why. Let's go to Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. It says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character and character, hope. And hope does not push us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You could be going through a hard time, or someone else that you love could be going through a hard time for the very simple reason that God is developing a perseverance in them. He's developing a character in them. That's, that's what it takes. You can't, you can't develop the, the, the muscles without going through the difficult times to tear those muscles and build them back up in the gym. You can't run a marathon without first pushing yourself through those shorter races to develop the ability, the perseverance, the stamina, the, the ability to run that long race. The refiner's fire. It requires going through the fire to work out those impurities. You know, when you stub your toe and if your immediate response is to yell out a curse word or to get angry or whatever you might do when you stub your toe, that moment when you stubbed your toe, what's inside comes out. It's this, it's this immediate reaction where you're not necessarily able to control what's truly in your heart and it just comes out. You blurt it out right there when you stub your toe. Well. Nobody around would have known that that was in your heart until you stubbed your toe. There's got to be those types of things in our life that I think God uh, allows those hardships. <clears throat> we might not always understand it, but it happens because there's a perfection, there's a process, there's a refining that's taking place in us. And so much of these issues are heart issues that need to be refined and purified as we draw near to the Lord. It's, a, it's part of our process. So don't, don't look at bad things, hard times, with such a negative light. Give thanks in those times because the Lord is doing something or refining us in a way that only those hard times can bring. The next thing I want to talk about is that sometimes we go through hard times simply to bring glory to God. That's right. Sometimes we go through the most difficult things for the sole purpose of bringing glory to God. I'm often baffled, and, and if I'm being transparent, if I'm being honest with you, it's, it's, I struggle with the story of the blind man in John chapter 9. See, this man, he went his entire life with this, with this difficulty, this hardship of being blind. It's, uh, it's 
hard to imagine. Uh, you know, I have sight. I have, you know, the use of all of my my limbs. You know, my I, I have a very good life. I feel very healthy. But if you took away something that that most people have and get to enjoy, like sight, hearing, and I can only imagine what type of life this man must have led that all the way through, we're talking, he wasn't a young man, a grown adult man, his entire life was blind. And it's, it's in chapter nine, verses three, it's, I don't know, unsettling for me, I guess would be a good word, that Jesus said that the man was born blind so that the works of God might be displayed in him. It says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, and that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, because the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said these things, he spat on the ground, made clay with his saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind, they said, Is not this the man who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes open? And he answered them and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? Said? He said, I don't know. Now, if you follow that scripture on, there's this big debate like this. I don't believe it. How did this come? And the, the man who was born blind basically says, look, are you a believer also? Like this man healed me. I was blind. Now I see. I can't tell you how he did it, but I know he did it. Now, it seems if you look at the tone with which the blind man speaks, it seems like he's not thinking how he was wronged all those years. All he's thinking about is the freedom that he has, the, the healing and what that did for him from that moment forward changed his life. Sometimes we go through things for the sole purpose of bringing glory to God. And we may have to endure those things for a long time. That's okay. Because if it brings glory to God in the end, praise the Lord. I'm but a vessel for you. I'm here for you. My life is to please you. My, my urge, my goal, my, my true desire is to love you, to please you, to serve you, to expand the kingdom because you are good all the time. So if that means that we have to go through something, well, we've developed perseverance most likely because we've gone through these difficult times. So let's persevere more. Let's go longer if we have to go longer in the trial, in the difficulty, and just wait for the moment when God chooses to get glorified because of our difficulty. That man did not know when he was going to be healed, but the point in time when he was, God was glorified. Now, you heard at the beginning of that passage, the disciples said, who sinned, this guy or his parents? Because remember, he was born blind. Of course, we know that the Lord did it simply because he wanted to be glorified. And I told you about the story of uh, the person from my church that was told, you know, well, you have this cancer. What sin is in your life? There is a place. There is a place where your sin has brought about your hardship. There are consequences for sin. Those consequences are very real. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. So guess what? We can't be very surprised when we sin or when we live a life of sin. We can't be surprised that there's hardships that may come as a result of that sin. 
if, if you step out on your spouse, you can't be surprised if your family breaks up. You sinned. There are consequences that they're not necessarily a godly consequence. That could just be because there's a domino effect when you make a mistake. Consequences. But there are godly uh, consequences as well. Guess what? If you cheat on a test, don't be surprised if you fail the class. If you lie on your taxes, don't be surprised if you end up in IRS trouble. If you, if you go through life not tithing, not being generous, not giving, don't be surprised if God doesn't bless you in your finances. He has established biblical principles that are very clear. If you're going to treat the money, your, your finances like it's yours, then don't be surprised when God said, oh, no, no, you said that was yours. You said you got this all taken care of. You don't want to follow my, my patterns, my rules, my established plan with giving and generosity. That's fine. But don't blame me when I'm not blessing you. You chose to say, I don't want your blessing. There's consequences to sin. If you don't obey God's direction for your life or seek his direction in the first place, you can't be surprised that you might end up going down a wrong path. There are consequences to sin. The fourth thing on why do we go through hard times? Because of Christ. And this is one that, dare I say, I hope, I hope we all have the blessing to endure hard times for Christ's sake. In John chapter 15, verses 18, it says, If the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you go down a few verses, it says, Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. Luke chapter 6, verse 22, it says, Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, insult you, reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 9 through 10, it says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Friends, if we're truly drawing close to the Lord and he is living in us and through us because we've died to sin. We've died to ourselves. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me and through me. Then that Christ that's coming through me is going to be something that's offensive to those around me. Sin is offended by holiness. Sin is offended by God. It, it, it doesn't, they don't, the two don't work together. And because I represent holiness, righteousness, goodness, godliness, I can anticipate, I can expect that I'm going to endure hardship because I was already told this is going to happen. Like, Jesus said it very clearly. There's no two ways about it. Like he said, yes, you're going to go through hard times, difficult times because of me. Second Timothy chapter 3, 12. In fact, everyone, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You could take that to the bank. So if you want to follow Christ, if you want to live a godly life, if you want to go after the Lord, please don't be surprised when you go through difficult times. It's, it's right there. Like red letter edition and all. Sometimes we go through hard times because of Christ. And it's not always fun. It's not always easy. But it's real. The last thing that the last thing that I want to that I want to highlight the fifth reason for why we go through hard times and this is 
probably the most profound thing that you'll hear on the program uh, today. Why do we go through hard times? I don't know, but God is sovereign. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. And anyone who tells you that they do know, I would challenge maybe they don't. I, I don't know. I, I don't always understand why I'm in the middle of the storm or why I'm going through some hardship. But my crisis management process is to, to, to have a godly perspective, not a reactionary presumption. I don't know why you're going through what you're going through or why the person you care about is going through what they're going through. It could be God wants to reveal something. It could be developing perseverance. It could be for His glory. It could be just because they're, they're walking upright with the Lord and that brings about persecution. What, what I've tried to do in my own life is to acknowledge, I, look, I want to first reflect, is my life upright? Am I walking upright? Is there something in my life that I need to change? Is there sin? Is there, is there something that is not righteous? Okay, check. I'm doing good there. Um, I can't answer whether God wants to reveal something. I can't answer whether He's trying to develop perseverance. I can't answer if it's simply for the, the because of Christ, unless it's an overt persecution because of preaching or something like, like that, of course. And so I have to be comfortable to, to step back and say, I don't know. But what I do know is that God is good. He is sovereign. He loves me. So I can take those puzzle pieces and put together a pretty confident, pretty comfortable image of what I'm going through. I, I don't know why, but I know God is good. He's sovereign. And whatever it is you're going through, Whatever it is your loved ones are going through, they're not as good as you think they are. Whatever they're going through is not as bad as it seems. And irrespective of both, God is sovereign. My encouragement to you today, try to have a godly perspective. Don't, don't just react when bad things happen. Try to search and see, Lord, what is it within me that needs more purification? Try to find ways to say, God, thank you so much for finding me worthy of being developed. And when you have no answers for anything and you don't understand why, just look to the heavens and say, God, I don't know, but thank you because I know you're good. I know you're sovereign. And I know all things work together for my good because I love you and I'm called according to your purposes. Friends, I hope this has been encouraging for you. And I hope that if you are in the middle of something, feel free to reach out. We'd love to pray for you. At Crosstalk TV is our social media handle. You can, of course, reach out to us on the website, crosstalk.org. And I'd, I'd love to just invite you if uh, you feel so compelled to send a contribution, help us with our financial expenses for these types of productions and the uh, broadcast airtime and such. Uh, you can do that by reaching out to 1-800-688-3422, or if you feel compelled, you can send a, a contribution by mail to P.O. Box 2528, Cedar Hill, Texas, 75106. I hope and pray that uh, you'll walk forward giving thanks in all things, knowing that God is sovereign. Until next time, shalom and God bless.